Thanks for tuning in. I'm Claire Hennessy, a mysterious spy who wrote about the most captivatingly infamous intellectual of the time. Christopher Marlowe is among the most accomplished and enigmatic of the Elizabethan playwrights. Joining us today is Dr. Robert Sawyer, professor in the Department of Literature and Language at East Tennessee State University. He's the author of Shakespeare Between the World Wars and Marlowe and Shakespeare: The Critical Rivalry. Welcome, Robert. How is your summer? Hi, Claire. Thanks for the invitation to talk about two of my favorite playwrights. The summer's been busy. I'm currently teaching a summer Shakespeare course right now while we're talking. <laughs> Um, after returning uh, from Barcelona early in the summer, where I was invited to present a paper actually on Marlowe's death, and we'll, we will discuss more about that as we go along. Let's begin with the context. Marlowe's spy identity is always the highlight among Elizabethan playwrights. He was allegedly a spy working for the Queen at the time, but other scholars point out that he was also a double spy. So, what can we learn from this mysterious identity in relation to the political and religious climate of the time? During his time working on his MA at Cambridge, where he matriculated, he began to be absent for long periods of time, particularly in 1584 and 1585. And it's interesting; they didn't really take attendance, but they did notice that at Cambridge, the way they knew he was absent was he wasn't using what was called the buttery. It's、mm-hmm. kind of like the snack bar. I've actually seen it. I've been at, at Cambridge and seen what it was. And、mm-hmm. he began to spend a whole lot more money than he ever did before this period.、Um, his scholarship would not have covered his meals and the extra money that he was spending.、Mm-hmm. So we think when we combine the absences with the increase his funds in hand. And one other detail. So that's two things that suggest he was doing something. Outside of his studies,、uh, right before he graduated,、uh, the university said that they would not allow him to graduate. And Queen Elizabeth's Privy Council, which is her most senior advisors, sent a letter of protest to the Cambridge authorities, stating that Marlowe, quote, and this is in all, all the documents, stating、mm-hmm. um, he, he should be awarded, quote, should be awarded his degree at the next commencement. Because he had done Her Majesty good service during his absences, ones that quote benefited his country.、Hmm. So he was probably sent by the Queen or the Privy Council to the English Catholic Seminary in Reims, France, which is just over the border from England, to pose as a student ready to convert. And we do know, and we have plenty of records, that many young men. Were being trained for the priesthood there to come back to England with the secret aim of converting England back to Catholicism. So he probably feigned falling into the Catholic line and then just reported everything back to the Queen. That's where that you get that kind of spy part. As most scholars agree, this was very dangerous work, since if discovered as spies or even double spies, they would be tortured and then killed. This is just one instance of the larger historical context in England during Marlowe's lifetime, as Stephen Greenblatt succinctly puts it. And I always read this part to my students because it shows you one day you could wake up and be the country be Catholic, one day <laughs> it would be Protestant. Right? Here's Greenblatt's quote: "In the space of a single lifetime, England had gone officially from Roman Catholicism to Catholicism under the supreme headship of the English King. That's the Anglican Church. Just when." It was really all the same features, except with Henry being the Pope. To a renewed and aggressive Roman Catholicism, that's when Bloody Mary briefly took the throne and put a lot of Protestants to death. And finally, to Protestantism again, when Elizabeth was named Queen.、Uh, Greenblatt says one would have to be extremely agile to survive the shifting religious winds, and that's probably true. Marlowe was just one of many talented young men who probably played both sides, pretending to want to convert to Catholicism, but actually reporting what he had seen and heard at the seminary to the Queen's Privy Council, and made good money doing so. Along with the Queen's favor, and he was granted、uh, his degree almost immediately from Cambridge when they received that letter that he had done good service to the state. He had enemies on both sides of the religious debate, probably, and he his personal temperament was often described as hot-headed and even violent. So he would make a good spy, probably. 
That's right. So, among these conjectures of Marlowe's death you just listed, what is your own take on the real reason for his death, and how Marlowe's death affected the critical views of him as a playwright? It's a very good question. Um, so we know for certain now there were a lot of rumors that sprung up, but we know at 10 a.m. on the 30th of May, 1593, Marlowe. Ingram Frischer, Nicholas Skears, and Robert Poley met at Eleanor Bull's boarding house in Deptford Strand on the outskirts of London. That's all documented. The questions, however, surrounding the meeting, which lasted over eight hours, include who decided to convene the meeting, why these four particular individuals were there, Mm -hmm. and why her house was chosen as the locale. What we know for sure is that by the end of the meeting, Marlowe was dead, and the other three individuals claimed that he was killed by Frisier in an act of self-defense during an argument over the bar tab, the final hospitality. If they'd been there eight hours, it was probably pretty high. They had lunch there. They went for walks in the garden. Um, and what, what it was, the bar bill at the time was called the reckoning. That was just the Elizabethan term for the, so whenever you hear the reckoning, that's the bar bill. While Marlowe was an aggressive man, I'm not convinced he had planned to stab Frisier for he had not even brought a weapon to the meeting. In fact, the only person who had was Ingram Frisier, the one that I'm pretty sure killed Marlowe. In addition, all of the other three men worked in some manner for Queen Elizabeth's most trusted spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham. My personal view, and I'm not sure if this is in the book because it's some new research, but my personal view is that the Queen and her Privy Council decided that Marlowe knew too much about the plots and counterplots of Arnark. And since he was reckless to begin with, um, I mean, he'd already murdered one man and he'd been charged with counterfeiting, coining is what they called it. They set him up for a false meeting in order to do away with a man who might reveal compromising information while under mm-hmm. investigation. The murder also, the reason I think it was at Madame Bull's place is because she was within the verge, which is a 12 mile radius that follows the Queen. So she would have control over the autopsy, it wouldn't be an independent or even maybe a truthful autopsy. The coroner to the royal household was William Danby, and he performed a hasty autopsy, and he shaped the official account of the encounter. It seems to me that the three of the other men got together after Marlowe was stabbed and said, let's get our stories straight, and here's what we're going to tell the coroner. In any case, Marlowe was quickly buried close by, which is also slightly odd, but probably to keep the body from being dug up and re-examined. And most scholars believe that it had been dug up. The autopsy that Danby recorded, there might have been discrepancies between what he said and what the skull looked like. It was definitely a knife into the skull and probably close to the eye. In addition, to make it seem like a setup, Frisier, all charges against him were dropped within a month. Hmm. I mean, he wasn't held... He wasn't even said to stay close by for more investigation. So it seems to me the monarch, this was the plan and it it had worked. And he he was completely scot-free at that point. So how it affected critical views, the second part of that question. So the widely circulated accounts of his death began to occur about five years later by writers such as Francis Mears, who reported that, quote, Marlowe was stabbed to death by a body serving man, a rival of his lewd love. That was in 1598, and it's completely inaccurate. (laughs) (laughs) Although two years later, William Vaughn got much closer to the truth when he wrote that the murder occurred in Deptford, where he met a group of three men, all with connections to the shadowy underworld of Elizabeth's spy network. Now, Vaughn claimed that Marlowe tried to stab Ingram but missed, and Ingram, drawing out his dagger in self-defense, stabbed Marlowe into the eye in such sort that his brains came out at the dagger's point and shortly after he died. According to this account, he had denied God and the Trinity, and that's why he he was murdered and why the stuff came out as I, because a lot of Puritans suggested that that I of his created those evil pamphlets and plays that he wrote. Um, As I noted in my book, though, although a number of works after Marlowe's death praised him, the scenario set up by Mears and then Vaughn was that Marlowe's death was, quote, poetic justice for the ungodly. And that became kind of the standard norm for many, many years. 
Um, as I suggest in my book, this attempt to vilify Marlowe marked in some ways the opposite boundaries of the two most famous Elizabethan dramatic writers. In my book, I so one witty intellectual and multifaceted Shakespeare, the other fevered, emotive, and especially bombastic. Uh, so the contrast between General Will Shakespeare and blasphemous Kit Marlowe began even in their own lifetimes. And between sympathy for Shakespeare and antipathy for Marlowe, with, which lasted well into the 19th century for most people. Um, in other words, if Marlowe didn't exist, we may have had to invent one who's the opposite, right? We're, we're defined by our opposites. Mm -hmm. In your book, Marlowe and Shakespeare, The Critical Rivalry, you mentioned that it was not uncommon for Elizabethan playwrights to collaborate with each other, right? And very often, their rhetorics can be found closely resemble each other, like some of Shakespeare's plays allegedly cross-referenced Marlowe's plays, or are the direct influence of Marlowe. As modern scholars still look for evidence of collaborations between Marlowe and other writers, in 2016, one publisher was the first to endorse the scholarly claim of a collaboration between Marlowe and Shakespeare. Namely, Henry VI by William Shakespeare is now credited as a collaboration with Marlowe in the new Oxford Shakespeare series published in 2016. So Marlowe appears as co-author of the three Henry VI plays, though some scholars doubt any actual collaboration. Now, some of these intertextual references have even gone further and bolder. An argument has arisen about the idea that Marlowe even faked his death and then continued to write under the assumed name of William Shakespeare, while academic consensus also rejects alternative candidates for authorship of Shakespeare's plays and sonnets, including Marlowe. Then we also have other critics viewing Marlowe and Shakespeare's relationship as one of a rivalry. So how would you define their relationship? Remember in Hamlet, in the opening scene, rivalry for them, and it's footnoted in every version, also had the meaning of partner. Mm -hmm. So when Marcellus and Bernardo were talking about, here's the rival of my watch, the rival of his watch was the partner of his watch. So that's how my book actually starts, saying that they were probably not what we think of as competitive rivals, but in some ways, probably friends. I wouldn't go as far as to say partners, but they were moving along the same track. Mm -hmm. I don't think they were trying to one up one another necessarily. I think they just were doing the same thing in two different theaters for two different theater companies. First, there is little doubt now that the two knew of each other, even if they never met. We don't have any evidence of them ever meeting. But as Robert Logan, the famous Marlovian scholar, and I'll reference him later, he said it's less likely that they didn't meet than that they did. There was just a small group. Some people estimate 200, 300 people in the theatrical world. And they certainly knew of each other, if not actually met. And we know in Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, Marlowe is the dead shepherd Phoebe mourns over, specifically when she speaks the line, quote, whoever loved that loved not at first sight, a line taken directly from Marlowe's poem, Hero and Leander. Moreover, and this goes back to the murder, when Touchstone, the clown in Act 3, claims that, quote, when a man's verses cannot be understood, it strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. And those lines almost certainly are a reference to Marlowe's murder, which occurred in that room and the boarding house over the reckoning of the bar tab at the end of the meeting. So I would say, and most critics, these intertextual allusions between Marlowe and Shakespeare suggest a veiled dramatic dialogue between the two, even though Marlowe was dead at this point. In addition, Robert Logan, who I just mentioned, believes that Shakespeare performed an intellectual adaptation of many of Marlowe's themes in his own plays. My example to my students is one only needs to think of the ambitious overreacher Dr. Faustus and compare him to Shakespeare's Macbeth to see parallels between their works. Let's talk about that 2016 book, which we started with the new Oxford Shakespeare, Gary Taylor, Terry Boris, Gabe, Egan, and a few other people. When the invented collection of Shakespeare's plays called The New Oxford Shakespeare, burst on the scene. It drew numerous reviews, both in the UK and abroad, and many led their essays with clickbait headlines, such as the following one in the New York Times. Um, quote, Shakespeare may have had a little more help than previously suspected. 
It went on to detail that the new Oxford collection lists Christopher Marlowe as Shakespeare's co-author on the three Henry VI plays. The correspondent emphasizing that it's our first time that a major edition, and it is, I mean, they're correct on this, it's the first time that a major edition of Shakespeare's works has listed Shakespeare's colleague, Marlowe, as a co-author on these works. The more important point is that the names of both authors, Marlowe and Shakespeare, are printed on the title page of all three parts of Henry VI. In the same time article, the volume's general editor, Gary Taylor, admitted that it was perfectly reasonable not to include Marlowe's name on the plays in earlier editions because they couldn't prove it. There were a lot of other people who were suspected collaborators, including Robert Greene and George Peel. So people didn't want to just pin down one of them. The only reason Marlowe's name can now be definitively added, and this is Taylor's words, Gary's head of the English department at Florida State University. The only reason Marlowe's name could not be definitively added was because Shakespeare had entered the world of big data. And no editors before had the confidence to put Marlowe's name actually on the same page. And so they used a lot of computerized data that's still very much in debate. And there are a lot of problems with that proving Marlowe did it because they were doing Zeta tests. And, and there's a number of these algorithmic things that they were running. And I, I, I believe Marlowe probably had a hand in it. I don't know if he was co-author, but their computer readings, and I've heard them lecture on this seem to prove, at the very least, let's say that, the findings make Marlowe, at the very least, a confirmed contributing author. I, and I think that's probably fair. Are there any concerns with this new designation? Here's my concern, and I think probably, I think you and I talked about this on the phone. Heather Hirschfield warns that we should not be blind to the appeal of big data analysis with the academic community, particularly in this time of an assault on the humanities. And she concludes that by pointing out that it is an irony worth noting that these explicitly humanist scholars are now enabled by what seem like the dehumanizing, mechanizing, and economizing work of computerized number crunching that turns style into machine-readable coordinates. And I think that warning is a good one for all of us to keep in mind. And even proponents of digital humanities admit, it seems key, this is what, where I came down finally, that research interest changes from solving a traditional humanist research problem, such as who was the author of a specific literary work, to an algorithmic problem, deciding which algorithm is the most effective in establishing the author. So we've turned kind of a humanist question into a mathematics problem, and that's her warning. We just need to be careful about that. That's right. So how popular were Marlowe's plays at the time? And could you also shed some light on the audience conversation and the theater goer's demography at the time as well? First, I'm going to talk about the popularity and then the type of people that sat there and made them popular, as your question mm -hmm. asks. So his two-part play, Gamberlane, parts one and two, were the productions that, according to Tom Reuter, gave Marlowe an immediate and lasting notoriety. They were crowd pleasers and commented on by the spectator critics. So in my book, even before other critics say these are really good plays, these are crowd pleasers, these spectator critics determined they were by paying to go to see them over mm -hmm. and over again. But other contemporary playwrights, such as Robert Greene and George Peel, attempted to imitate their plays, but nobody, they didn't have the draw and they weren't Marlowe writing them either. The other thing about Tamburlaine Parts 1 and 2 is from 1594 onwards, it was a staple at the Rose Theater. Uh, that's where the Lord Admiral's men, you know, uh, Marlowe's company, just a short distance from the Globe Theater. It's so well known that even Shakespeare mimicked part of some of the lines. This is another place where Shakespeare borrows from Marlowe, knowing his the joke will land because people will recognize the lines. It was so well known, Tamburlaine Part 1 particularly, that even Shakespeare mimics some of the lines from the play in the mouths of at least one character. In the second part of Henry IV, for example, the character Pistol bungles the first lines of Marlowe's play, describing the hollow pampered jades of Asia, which cannot go but 30 miles a day, knowing full well his audience, and here's the audience, composed of a virtual cross-section of the society, including apprentices, lawyers, soldiers, and even aristocratic families and females um, would catch the verbal echo from Marlowe's work. Mm -hmm. So these early spectator critics, as I just, as I call them in my book, they shaped the type of plays that were performed by their pennies that they paid to get in. 
One interesting thing I learned in doing research a few years ago, some critics did not like the main character of Tamburlaine since he was a lowly shepherd at the start. We hope you have enjoyed the episode so far. If you want to hear the entire episode, you can subscribe at theglobalnovel.com slash subscribe. Thank you so much for listening.